Welcome to Cascade Church. We exist to love God, love people, and live generously. We are a church committed to being followers of Jesus and being disciples who make more disciples. We have services in person here in Monroe at 8, 9.30, and 11.15 a.m. every Sunday. Come join us. This week, our men's and women's Bible study groups are launching for the fall. It's not too late to join, so visit CascadeChurch.org or the Cascade app to learn more. Today, we're beginning our new series, Unoffendable. Please join us in opening your Bibles, and let's dive in. Welcome, to Cascade. How are we doing today? Yeah? Good. Awesome. All right. Like Matt said, I will not be offended. If you stand up and go listen to Dan Bushy, he just got back from Nepal. He is going to be pumped up. It's an amazing class, so I won't be offended if you get up and go, um, especially since we're starting the series on being unoffendable. So I can't be offended by virtue of the title, okay? We're starting a series on being unoffendable. Uh, we wanted to do this. We have prayed through this, like how, God, do you want us to set the tone for this next year, 2023, 2024, the school year? It's a lot coming up. We're ending this year, and then we go into 2024. I can't believe that we're just running through time right now. Uh, there's a lot to be excited about in 2024, right? Uh, my son, my middle son, uh, this is his last year in high school. He's a senior this year, and then we get rid of him. It's a lot to be excited about for 2024. I'm kidding. We were sitting around uh, my wife and, and Kaden and uh, one of her friends, Stu, just talking about this next year and how to best set him up uh, to end this school year out and, and what we're looking forward to that he's going to be stepping into. We're, we're excited about that. I'm also excited about this next year will be the first school year that my, my youngest child is able to drive herself anywhere. She's 16. That's exciting. Any other parents been there? All your kids are driving. You don't have to cart them all around. There's several things to be excited about. And even as John was talking about, or John, as Matt was talking about with our, our church and the different things, different classes, there's a lot that we're looking forward to in this next year of how we can connect and grow and what God is doing, the baptisms we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, th there's a lot to be excited about from where we've been, where we're going, but there's also a few things that might make this next year a little difficult. Yeah? Yeah? When you think about 2024 and, and where we're going and how we live in a world that is a world of offense. That's just the way the world operates. Would you agree? There's plenty of things to be offended by. Amen? That should be easy to amen that one. We can just list all the different topics and the, the way our world operates, it almost demands that if you are not offended by something, then I don't know what kind of a person you are. You don't have a heart. You're not a loving individual unless you're filled with anger. How that goes together, I'm not sure. But you watch any debate around any issue and you'll see two people pitted against each other that are fighting fire with fire, which is an idiom that we use, even though it sounds idiotic. Has anyone else ever tried fighting fire with fire? It doesn't work out so well. But we live in a world of offense that says that you need to match each other's offense so that you can overpower one another's offense. And as we look forward to this next year, one of the reasons why we prayed around this is because there's going to be a lot to be offended by, right? I'm, I, someone's already crafting an email right now because I put something up on the screen. We are so easily triggered and angered and offended. And when we think about what's coming up and as we as, we as a church look forward to the next year, we want to ask this question. Is it possible to be unoffendable? 
Do you think that might get some attention in this world if we were some of the few people able to live in peace and in the midst of some of the most offensive time, but living in an unoffendable manner? But as we look at some of the things that, that may be trigger words in society and we, we think about how easy it is to be offended around some of these things. These are just like the high level things, but let me, let me ask you, how do you on a personal level deal with offense and anger when, when things don't go just the way you want? How many of you have struggled being offended with maybe your neighbor the last time they... I don't know. What did your neighbor do to upset you? Has anyone ever been triggered or offended by their neighbors? You live in the Frylands, like it's impossible, right? Like you're so close with each other. Like you, it's easy to be offended when your neighbor does something, raises their own flag, says a certain thing, doesn't dispose of their trash in the properly way when they break the HOA codes. How do you deal with offense when your neighbor, or what about, what about your coworker? Or how many of you have a hard time forgiving someone in your family? So when you make it a little more personal, how do you deal with offense? What's the biblical guidelines? Like how does Jesus call us? How does Paul direct us to understand the word of God to live unoffendable? Open up to Ephesians chapter four. This is the first half of the verse where we read, be angry. You are commanded to be angry. It says it right there in bold text. In your Bibles, be angry. You get your golden ticket. Biblical sample of approval, you can be angry. Is anyone else excited about that or just me? Rant on Facebook. Put whatever bumper sticker you want on your car. Be angry. Show the world how angry you are, but do not sin. Do you feel this tension here? Where we are commanded to be angry, but then challenged to not sin. Like, what's the tipping point there? When is it okay to be angry, and at what point do you fall into sin? I would say, especially in America since the 1920s, uh, at the dawn of fundamentalism, we as Christians decided that the world needed to know what lines we would draw in the sand so that everyone knew exactly what we were offended by and how angry we were by those things. Do you think back to the 1920s when fundamentalism was established in the evangelical church? And we wanted to make sure that the world knew that as far as Christians go, we are completely behind the abolition of alcohol. We will not drink. We will not support these underground bars. We will fight against alcoholism. There's a line in the sand. We will not drink. In the 1920s, we will not gamble. We will not play cards, whether it's poker or uno. If it's a card, it's sin. And we want the world to know it. We will not play cards. We will not drink alcohol. We will not gamble. And by no means will we ever be caught dead dancing. The impartable sin, right? You think about fundamentalism and and how that started in the 1920s. We wanted to draw a line in the sand and make sure everyone was on the same page and everyone knew these are the things that anger us. And when we read this, we, we kind of try to make sense of the tension that is found there when we're told to be angry, but then challenged to not sin. We do so by attributing anger to the righteous anger that is a merit badge for Christians to wear. Amen? We are told that there's a righteous anger and that's what we are commanded to have. That's what Paul was writing here because this is the Greek word, not just for anger, but righteous anger, right? No, Uh, there is no righteous anger here. This is just be angry. 
But we wonder, like, the only way that we can make sense of that, and I, I challenge you to do this this afternoon, do a Google search on righteous anger. This verse will come up and the commentary will say that we are called, in 2012, Legionnaire uh, Ministries released a Bible study on this and says that we are called to be angry over the things that make God angry. Have you ever heard that before? If we're supposed to imitate God and we're supposed to share God's heart, then we should be angry about the things that make God angry. And that is righteous anger. And that becomes our merit badge so that we can draw a line in the sand and make sure everyone in this world knows that we are more like God because we are just as angry as God. Does that feel consistent with the life of Jesus Christ? So I would actually disagree with what a lot of commentaries say when we superimpose righteous anger to this scripture. And I would ask that maybe we need to dig a little deeper and ask the question, is Paul here commanding us to be angry or could he be referring to something else? If you Dig a little deeper. If you look at your micro notes, how many of your Bibles have micro notes? You look at verse 26 here and there's a little letter and the letter directs you to go to an Old Testament book. Anyone have that? Okay, well, there's two scriptures that Paul, one he is quoting verbatim and the other he is teaching from here in Psalm 4 and Psalm 37. Word for word, Paul quotes Psalm 4.4 where in the Old Testament it says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and be silent. So this is what Paul is quoting from here. Now, it's interesting where the Old Testament carries this command, be angry, but then it immediately challenges us to do what with our anger? Ponder in your beds. And... Don't use your words. That's what God gave us the internet for. You can, in your silence from your bed, pull out your laptop and just go off on Instagram, Facebook, or whatever, right? As long as you're being quiet about it, you can say whatever you want to say. No, like, be angry, ponder in your hearts on your beds, and be silent. And then in Psalm 37, verse 8, this is where Paul was teaching from, where it says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself because it tends only to evil. So this is really interesting where you look at the Old Testament. And I want to look closely, a little linguistic nerd stuff, at the, the tense of these words. In Greek, when Paul uses this word, this command to be angry. It is in second person plural, okay? So it's yens, you guys, or y'all. I don't know what part of America you're originally from, but that's the part of speech. You all. And it's an imperative verb, which means you are commanded to do something, but it's a passive command versus an active command command. And that's where the nuance comes in. And this is the nuance that I think we kind of let slip through our fingers because we just want to be entitled to our anger. Amen and hallelujah. A passive command versus an active command. And this shines brightly in the Hebrew language because the Hebrew language often carries word pictures with it. And There could have been a different word used here for the command to be angry, the active word to be angry, which is the word kara, which is where we get the American word karen or karen. (laughs) I apologize for what our culture has done to you if your name is Karen, okay? But you think of a Karen, again, I'm sorry, you know what I'm talking about. Someone who has been offended and they have owned that offense and they have identified with that offense and they are by all means, they're going to step up and fight against that offense. Do you feel it? The word kara in Hebrew is the stoking of a fire 
where you intentionally put on fire and build up the intensity of the heat. That is an active anger. I own it, I build it, I stoke it, I'm putting my energy into being angry. That's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is ragaz, which is something that will happen, but the word picture that goes with it is an earthquake, a trembling. Okay, now, do you make an earthquake happen? No. Do you respond when an earthquake happens? If you have any level of intelligence, yes. You respond to an earthquake, a quaking, a trembling. And that is the word that is used for be angry. So it's not necessarily a command. I'm commanding you to grow in your anger. It's the acknowledgement life is gonna happen. Y'all are gonna get triggered. When you get angry, because it will happen, So it's a command, an imperative that is just acknowledging this is going to happen. You will emotionally respond and react. You can't help it. When we were driving back just a couple of weeks ago to our our home and we were all together and having a great family moment in in our vehicle, in our van, and, and my middle son just had something stirring inside of his body that he allowed to happen inside of the car and it offended everyone in the car. Did anyone have to work at being offended? No, it's gonna happen. If you're normal, if you're healthy, you will respond to something and you'll wanna roll the windows down and and change the atmosphere a little bit, right? So it's not the fact that something happens because something is going to happen. What do you do with that? The command is not to grow in the intensity. The command is to say, all right, this is going to happen. What do I do when this happens? And in the Old Testament, David, on several different occasions, was laying this out. And in the New Testament, that is what we find Paul bringing to the attention of the New Testament church. He spent three chapters talking about the greatness of what happens inside of us when we receive Jesus Christ, the truths that now identify and become who we are. And in chapters four, five, and six, the consistent theme that Paul is digging into is that you are now dead to your old way of life and you are now replacing it with something new. That's important because the question being asked here is what do we do with our anger because anger is going to happen. When anger happens, we are not called to own it, to relish in it, to sit in it, to allow ourselves to be defined in it and to use it as a merit badge to the world so they know how godly and holy we are. Instead, we are supposed to do something when the inevitable happens. And that is what Paul is bringing our attention to here in chapter four. You read the whole context of chapter four, and not only do you see that this word, be angry, agathe, agathos, is a passive imperative. So not only does the word not agree with that sentiment of a righteous anger, but the context is void of defining a righteous anger. It's just when anger happens. So when Paul here is writing to the New Testament church and starting in verse 17, he starts setting up this new way of living life and how you're no longer like the Gentiles, but now since you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have learned how to live the life of Jesus. When you get angry, therefore, you have a different response. That's why he says therefore, because he spent the last Half of the chapter setting this up. So he begins by saying, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak 
the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Y'all will be triggered, be angry, and yet do not sin. So when you are inevitably angry, what are you supposed to do? Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay, so you're supposed to do something with your anger, but you don't fight fire with fire. That's the idiom that we use when, when, when we're trying to describe matching the intensity of another individual. Can we all just take for a minute to thank God and thank our local fire departments that they don't show up ready to fight fire with fire. The fire truck doesn't show up and your house is on fire and they're like, all right, Leroy, hook up the hose to the gas tank and we're gonna extinguish this fire with a whole load of gas. That would be bad, right? But that's what we feel this Bible verse gives us is, is the freedom to match the intensity, the, 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 the passion and the anger that we find in this world with a righteous anger. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's actually saying, if you want to fight fire, you douse it with the opposite. You fight fire with the grace, the forgiveness, and the Christ-like life that you find in Jesus Christ. So when the before the sun goes down on you, don't fight fire with fire. Match it with the opposite and replace that anger with the life of Jesus Christ. And he, he says, what are you supposed to replace it with? He then compares anger to a thief. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And then he compares it with corruptive talk. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for the building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to all those who fear. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, but let all, Okay, so here Paul brings it back to the understanding of anger. He used two other illustrations of how we give up our rights to the old way of living and seek to replace it with the new life of Jesus. So he makes no mistake that he, he wasn't just saying, you know, be angry as long as it's righteous anger because he just uses the word oriathea there where he comes back here and he emphasizes the fact that we're supposed to do what with anger? Let go of anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Does he leave any room for hanging on to any kind of anger? No, so the only way that you can make that make sense is to understand that the word itself means you will become angry. But in those moments of being angry, you have an opportunity and you have a choice to be unoffended. So there are times in your life where you're going to be tempted to steal with a righteous steelery. No. But when he was talking, like these, the people that he was writing to that, that were oppressed, that did not have access to many things, there were many times in their life where they were almost rightfully tempted to steal. But in that moment of temptation, replace that temptation to steal with a desire to work, to labor, and to provide not only for yourself, but for other people. And in the same way, there are gonna be times where you're going to be tempted to have unwholesome talk. Anyone else stub your toe recently or just get irritated with someone? You're, you're gonna be tempted to say something unwholesome about someone, and you may be warranted for that. But in that moment, warranted or not, 
righteous or unrighteous, it's the same either way that we fill in our hearts, not with the flesh, but with the faith of Jesus Christ. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So instead of giving in to our rights, even our right to righteous anger, we're supposed to take that as an opportunity to lay down our old self and to pick up the new life of grace and forgiveness and truth in Jesus Christ. Does that challenge anyone else aside from me? Because so much of us, we've felt like over time that we have the right to anger. We have the right to respond. But even if we do it in the name of righteousness, is that something that can be maintained? Can you maintain righteous anger? If, if we are to think that this word to, to be angry is a command to be angry about all the things that anger God, then let's think about that just for a second. Can you maintain that kind of anger? If you're going to be angry about the things that anger God. Let me, let me ask you an easy question. What is it that angers God? Is it just the top 10 list of sin? The ones that make us feel better, the one that, that aligns with our heart or our social paradigm? Is, is that the sin that is okay to give into righteous anger? But if we are going to be consistent with righteous anger, then God's righteousness is against that three-letter word. All sin. So if we're to be angry in a righteous anger, how much of our time is going to be spent being angry about everything? You will never not be angry. Does that seem like a sustainable, Christ-like way of life? No, not only that, not is it not only maintainable, it's not sustainable because at some point that righteous anger has to turn where? to your own sin. So now you're finding yourself always angry at everyone for everything as well as yourself for your own shortfallings. Are we commanded to be angry in a true, consistent, righteous anger? No, you can't do it. But instead, when you are stirred, when you are quaked, and you find yourself responding even to things that are not consistent with God, his character, or what he wants for us. It's not wrong to be stirred and angered at those things. But we take that anger and we immediately give it over to Jesus and find his life, his peace, his truth, his forgiveness to fill those things in. That's why Paul ends here by calling us to think about Jesus. And the question is, is Jesus a bad firefighter? Did he fight fire with fire? When he experienced the things that were not in line with God, did he match those things with an intense, righteous anger? Did Jesus have to confront politics of his day? Yes. Do you remember the scripture where he grew and stoked his anger towards Caesar and the Roman government? And that one's missing, isn't it? What about with people's sins, like with sexuality or gender? Like when, when Jesus confronted those who were willingly walking outside of God's will, was he filled and did he stoke that anger? Was he angry at those people? You don't find that scripture. Climate change, I, this, I don't know. There's a couple of times where Jesus did change the climate, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, immigration, that's another hot button issue today. Like there's plenty in the word of God that talks about the sojourners and how we treat them, which would actually be very challenging to a lot of us. Um, religion, did Jesus ever confront religion? But he never got angry, right? Okay, we'll come back to that one. The world is broken did Jesus stoke and stir his anger and just vent 
about his anger, about the brokenness of the world and the world systems. So when you look at all of these things, the only thing that Jesus even slightly began to show anger towards was in which area? Religion. So as you unpack even those, first of all, we need to be challenged by that fact that most of the stuff that we deem acceptable to be angry about under the clause of righteous anger are things that Jesus never expressed anger over. That should convict all of us anyways, right? But then when, even when you study Jesus's response, when the Bible says that he did get angry, you see it very consistent with him being shaken by something that was happening around him that had to do with the religious system keeping people out of relationship or the grace of his heavenly father. That was the only time that he even began to respond. But even in that response, we see that Jesus held it in line, responded appropriately, and it was something that he didn't hang on to at all. When he tossed the temple, everybody's favorite one, and I had someone approach me last week asking like, is it okay that we sell coffee in God's house? Because get, would, would, would God flip our coffee tables? Would Jesus do that? I don't believe so. When you, when you read this and you see what was happening here, Jesus, especially it's recorded in all four gospels in Luke 19, he gives it the most amount of time where Jesus came to Jerusalem and he looked at the heart of Israel and his heart broke for the, for the nation of Israel to be connected to his father again. And he went to the temple and he saw the corruption that was in the temple. It wasn't the fact that they were just selling something in the temple. In Leviticus, it, it, it talks about in chapter five how much to sell things for or what to sell things so that people can make their sacrifices. That in itself was not wrong. It wasn't the fact that something was being sold in the house of God. It was the fact that people were being taken advantage of and the system was corrupted and was extorting the hearts of the people. And not just any people, all four of these passages specifically talk about those who are selling the doves, which is the poor man's sacrifice. It says in Leviticus 5, if you can't afford a lamb, then take the cheaper option, the dove. And if you can't afford the dove, then there's a flower offering. There, there's ways that we can make this make sense even if you don't have enough money. But here we find that even at that level, the poor were being taken advantage of so that the Sadducees could live lavished, comfortable, materialistic lives. That is what Jesus was upset about. That my house, that is supposed to be a house of prayer and intimacy and connection where the children of God can come to God and experience him is being treated as a den of thieves. So he sees it, he gives a day to pray about it, then he steps in, throws over some table, makes a point to show everyone what the house of God is supposed to be. In Mark chapter three, he expresses a similar sentiment. It says that he is angered by the Pharisees' hardened hearts. And this arose over the healing of this, this man's hand on the Sabbath day. And just as the Sadducees had corrupted the temple, the Pharisees had corrupted the laws of God, where Jesus was saying the law of God should lead us to life in relationship with God. But you have expanded on it, you've added to it, and you've choked the life out of the nation of Israel. So he was angry at the Pharisees, angry at the Sadducees, but he responded appropriately. When the disciples tried to hold the children back from him, it says that Jesus was angry, but he didn't like drop a holy elbow on the disciples and just start ranting and raving and for the next six months just go on this daily tirade of how you're not supposed to treat children this way. He saw it, he responded, and he put it to rest. When he told Peter to get behind him, for being Satan, it didn't even say that Jesus was angry, you just equate calling someone Satan with anger in the same sentence, right? 
But even then, when Jesus saw something and told Peter, your heart is not thinking the thoughts of God, you're thinking the thoughts of man. I want to draw you in line with the heart of God. He responded, he spoke to Peter, but then he immediately brought Peter and the other three disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration to see the fullness of God. So in each of these situations, even when Jesus had to reckon this stirring or this this anger that was in him, he addressed it, responded appropriately, and put it to rest. So when we see these writings and we read what Paul is saying, when he sets the tone at the beginning of chapter four of Ephesians, listen to what he said. There is something when you are angry, when you are tempted to speak badly, when you are tempted to steal, when you are tempted to go back into your old lifestyle, there will be a temptation to live a life of flesh or to live a life of faith that demonstrates the way of God. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Like when you read that paragraph, can you hold that paragraph next to a life of entitled angerment? Being angry, owning it, stoking it, growing in it, even in the name of righteous anger, that is not consistent with what you just read. So Paul says, when you are angry, in your anger, the NIV is the only one that I saw that actually translated, in your anger, I prefer y'all will be triggered. You can feel free to write that in. Y'all will be triggered and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You were not made to live in anger. So give no opportunity to the devil. Let it all go. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. What Paul was saying is you are made to live in the life that Jesus made you to live, to live a life that looks like him. You are not made to live a life of anger. Even though that's what our world says, you need to be offended, you need to be angry, you need to be passionate. However we wanna wrap it up, even if it's wrapping it up in the guise of righteous anger. You were not made to live in and maintain a state of fight or flight. When you experience something, when you are angered by something, it is meant to be a short burst that directs you to a response. You study the fight or flight syndrome when something happens and and all of your energy goes to your core and then all the blood flow is loosened up in your limbs and you're ready to either fight or you're ready to run. Something happens and you're called to respond immediately so you can get out of that point of stress and into a point of safety. But what happens when your body stays in that state of offense and anger? and fight or flight. You study that and you find that that is what chronic stress is. Chronic stress syndrome, when your adrenal glands are depleted, when you are always living on edge, always ready to fight, always ready to defend, you're staying on guard all the time, your body becomes depleted, exhausted, and fragile because you were not meant to live that way. Instead, we are called to be stirred, be angry, because it's gonna happen, but to allow that to direct us to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the right response 
of letting go, forgiving, and living at peace and unity. That is the way that we were meant to live. So today is this challenge. We're starting this series on being unoffendable. And and, and today, the only thing I really wanted to unpack with you is taking away our right for righteous anger. Because I think that is what our community as believers holds on to the most. We have the right to righteous anger. But that's not the way God has made us to live or the way that Jesus modeled for us to live. So what would it feel like? And man, to me, this just feels like absolute freedom. To take your offense and to lay it down. Stop owning it. Stop feeling entitled to it. Stop stoking it. Stop being a Christian Karen. And start saying, all right, there's a stirring here. I want to lay it down for that to be your first response. Can you lay it down? What is your offense? We can start high level, like whatever political, sociological issue it is that triggers you when I put up the full list, like there's plenty of them there. What begins to trigger you? Can you begin to lay it down? Let's go deeper than that. Let's go go personal. In your heart, what are you holding on to? Have you been hurt? Has injustice been acted upon you? Has someone done something wrong to you? It may be evil, even in those situations, we, we feel the need to hold on to and to identify and to foster unforgiveness. Regardless of what it is, high level, low level, interpersonal, can we start today by recognizing that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the life that he's called us to live, he has called us to lay it down and to be open for the life of the gospel of peace, which we'll unpack more next week. But I wanna invite the ushers to come down and the worship team comes out. I want to invite you in your hearts in this moment to allow the spirit to speak to you. Is there something in your life that God is calling you to be open to lay down? Jesus, we uh, come before you right now and we're, we're gonna make a sacrifice of um, our tithes, our, our offering. We wanna give to you so that your mission here in this church, through this church, can grow and have an impact on Monroe and on our lives. So Jesus, we wanna lay down that sacrificial offering and give it to you so that you can multiply that. But Jesus, I also want us to lay our lives down And in this moment, especially when it comes to anger or unforgiveness or hurt, for us to recognize that it may not be wrong for us to feel the way we do, but you call us to enter into a life that looks like you, to lay down these offenses and to be unoffendable. So Jesus, that starts with us just recognizing that we need to let it go. We need to lay it down. So we come to your altar, we come here and now, and we lay down our lives at your feet. In your name we pray, amen.